Okay, Dr. Morton here recording the lecture for the 19th. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, this is going to be a relatively short lecture. Uh, I will just go over um, uh, basically uh, some of the questions that are going to be on the test. I, I haven't uh, completely developed the test yet, but I'll go over these. These are some of the things that I'd like you to kind of be aware of. And uh, I'll continue to review. I think at this point, um, uh, the, so if we look at the syllabus, uh, what we were supposed to cover were the, uh, the peripherals on the KL25Z. Um, and, uh, I don't think, I, I don't think I'm going to cover this since we're not really doing these labs this semester because it's very difficult to distribute these things. I'm just not going to, I just think this is partly what we have to give up to get done what, the part that we have bitten off. Um. Let me just say a couple of general things first, and then uh, and then I'm gonna. One is that uh, I, I I there are students that have not done the labs. I, I don't know what to say. So let me just make this as crystal clear as I can. You need to get the labs done. So I will hold um, I will hold a uh, a help session for debugging labs. I'll do that uh, uh, I'll do that tomorrow. Uh, I'll try and do that maybe uh, maybe at um, about 1 p.m. So let me write that down so I don't forget. So I'll and we'll use the same Zoom link that that uh, so 1 p.m. Friday, and I'll send out an email. So we'll do that 1 p.m. Friday. And I'll also be able also provide help uh, debugging help for projects. Uh, I'll give you a suggestion. So if you're having struggle with your project, then show up at 1 p.m. tomorrow Zoom session. We'll use the same Zoom link that I use for office hours. It's the one posted uh, on your syllabus uh, on Blackboard or not on the syllabus. It's on Blackboard in the main uh, content section. Just scroll down and click that link. 1 p.m. tomorrow, and I'll help anybody that needs. Code help. We'll talk about your. Uh, we'll talk. We'll help with labs. We'll talk about projects. What I recommend you do if you live in town is get come into the lab tomorrow from ten to about uh, two or three. Um, come into the lab and get help. Uh, there'll be people there that can help. We'll also have. That's tomorrow's the last Friday of the entire semester. We we will have opportunities next week on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. To get help on your micro labs and your micro projects, there will be people in the lab. I'll be there Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. On Monday and Wednesday, I'll come in at two and I'll stay for a good hour or so, maybe longer. On Tuesday, I'll come in at eleven thirty and I'll stay for a good hour or so or longer if need be. So come early. Uh, there may be some DSD students, and so I, you know, they may need some help too. If we have more than 14 students, you may have to wait, although that's not that's only been a problem once, maybe one student this entire semester have we had, had to wait for a few minutes. So uh, so it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but I do want you to come in and get help if you need it. That's it. That's the last chance. After next Wednesday, uh, I will not be on campus until January. So come in. Come in and get the help tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. That's four days. So if you live in San Antonio or you're, you know, nearby, uh, not, you know, an hour away or so, you can come in and get help. If you do not get the labs done, you will get it. You need at least eight of the nine labs. We did lab zero, which doesn't really count. Um, and then lab one. And lab zero was making your freedom board. I mean, uh, your Viva board. Lab then lab one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. We did not do lab nine, and we did lab ten. The numbers may have shifted a little bit, but the way they are on Blackboard now is the official. Th those are the official numbers. So you can go to the lab section on Blackboard and see, and you'll see what what the actual numbers are. The turn-in sheets help a little bit. They're they're a small part of your lab grade. They do they are not sufficient. You can turn in all the turn-in sheets for your laboratories, and you will not get credit for your laboratories. You only get credit if you have demoed your running code to the TA, or 
you have made a video with your ID in the picture of your running code and sent it to the TA, not to Dr. Morton, not to me, but to the TA, because the TA is grading the labs. The TA is correlating those scores, and at the end of the semester, he will give me a list of everybody that's got all nine labs. He'll give me a list of everybody that's got eight of the nine labs, and he'll give me a list of people that are missing more than one lab. Everybody missing more than one lab and everybody who does not finish their project gets an incomplete in the course. And you have to make it up. You've got one year. And then after that, your grade converts to an F. <coughs> and uh, I think there's at least one student this semester whose grade is going to convert to an F because he, he didn't do anything. He didn't take the final exam. He didn't. I mean, I probably should have given him an F then. But in any event, um, it's, it's, it's actually a golden handshake to not be flunked, to instead let you try and make it up over the next year. But you have to make it up. And if you don't make it up, then your incomplete will convert to an F at the end of one year. <coughs> That's very reasonable. Uh, I know there are people in Houston that don't want to show. I get that. So make the videos. Do your labs and make the videos. If you can't, if you can't get it, if you can't figure it out and you need help, fine. I'm willing to help on Zoom. Send me. I've, I've helped a number of students. Send, send me an email. Uh, we'll go on Zoom. We'll look at your code. Or you can come to the help session on Monday morning. I, I think I've missed one or two. I've missed two of them, I think, over the, over the semester. But mostly I've been there for them. Uh, we don't have that many people. One or two. Two or three. That's it. Uh, so I will do another one Monday at noon. Show up if you need help. I'll probably do help sessions all next week, and I may even do some over the break. Uh, uh, I may do one like on, I don't know, I may do one on win on Thanksgiving, maybe in the morning or something. But you need you need you need to get your work done. Just because we're in COVID doesn't mean you don't have to do your work. And we'll, we're going to try. You know, we're trying. We're bending over backwards to try and help everybody we can. I've gone in. I've only gone. I've only missed going in four days a week. I uh, uh, one week I went in three days, or maybe, yeah, I didn't. I'm trying to think. Not, yeah, I went in, went in yesterday twice. So I'm going into UTSA and I'm staying around and helping students, but uh, students aren't showing up. So what can I do? So get your work done, and if you don't get it done then you're getting incomplete. Uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say. All right, so anyway, uh, so I'm going to go over the test, and uh, and this hopefully will help you kind of prepare for it. And uh, it should be, it, it'll be pretty, if you've, if you've done the work, uh, you're not going to have a lot of trouble with the test. Uh, you know, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be online. It'll be mostly, mostly, Similar to the questions, similar to the tests we've had before. If you did okay on those, you'll be fine. Um, it's really hard to do, in my view. It's hard to do these online tests. I, I have a real problem with that because most of the engineering stuff, I, it's you know, we, we usually we do problems and we have to draw things and stuff like that. It's really hard to do that and then you know have it graded efficiently. Okay, so let me get rid of this. Then just a review. So next Wednesday, the twenty fourth. That's it. Last day to make up pick labs. After that, don't send me videos. I want you to have it done by Wednesday because we don't have time to deal with it after that. We have to have this done. And so you don't plan on doing this stuff over Thanksgiving or, you know, uh, the first week or so in January and December and sending that to me. It's too late. You have to have it done by Wednesday at midnight. And, uh, and again, the labs should be sent to the TA. This is not fair to the TA to make when he's trying to study for his finals to have him getting multiple labs that he has to review and grade and stuff. Now, if you don't turn in the, the lab sheets, you'll still get a grade in the course. It'll cost you maybe a, you know, a, a, little, a little bit on your lab. If you don't turn in any of them, it'll probably cost you 5% of your lab grade. But if you turn in most of them, then you might lose a percent or something. So turn the sheets in, but that's not the end of the world if you don't. But I mean, I, I want you to do them. Don't get me wrong. But but if you don't do, if you haven't demoed the lab to the TA 
or you haven't made a video of the lab with your ID card in the video and sent that to the TA, you're not getting credit for the lab. Just that simple. And the last day, the 24th of November at midnight. After that, we're not accepting any more, any more, any more uh, videos for lab completion. So that's that's it. That's it. And you've got you've got tomorrow and all and next week till Wednesday. All right, and today for that matter. All right. The final projects are due on the first of December, last day, uh, last day of class, and you have to turn them in midnight again. For those, uh, I, uh, I think I created a link on Blackboard, but if I don't, I'll do that as soon as I finish this video. So upload them to Blackboard or send me a video. I'd rather you upload them to Blackboard because then they don't get lost. Sometimes when you send me a video, it gets put in my junk folder and I never see it and then you think I've seen it and I haven't. And then you don't get a grade, and then you're all upset, and then I, I'm trying to find the thing, and I, I have to. I, it's, it takes me a long time to find emails in, in the morass of emails that I get, and especially when I have to look through the junk folder. It's really bad. So please upload it to Blackboard. But if, if, if for some reason you can't do that, send it to me. And when people upload it to Blackboard, there's a whole bunch of different ways. You can upload the video. You can give a, a, the link to. A, you can upload it to YouTube and give me the link. You can. Uh, put it in, I don't know, some Dropbox or something uh, and give me the link to that uh, and permission. Uh, students have figured out lots of different ways to do it, but uh, make sure you some way you do it. All right. Okay. With that, I'm going to quit. We'll go through the, we'll go through the, so here's, here's a test I gave uh, a year ago, but this of course was in class written test. And these were the general questions. And then I had students do a, 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 a module a specific uh, test on on their the, one of the modules they used in their project, but we're not going to do that this time. Uh, I'm going to pick some general modules that everybody should be familiar with, and uh, we'll probably do those. And it'll just be one big test. All right. So the, the Viva board has a number of features that make it useful for lab projects. Evaluate the following statements: true or false. Traditional mechanical switches are expensive compared to touch pads. Yes, they are absolutely expensive. Touch pads are almost free if you already have a micro and you print a circuit board. Uh, mechanical switches can that, shoot a, a really good mechanical switch for uh, you know for like a video game could cost you know fifteen bucks or something. Uh, you can buy three micros for that and and a bunch of printed circuit boards. Uh, or you can buy fifteen micros for that and a bunch of printed circuit boards. So yeah, so. Switches are expensive, and even just a standard little switch, like the switch that's on your Viva board, if you buy a nice, you know, those cost me about a quarter a piece, 25 cents for those, and um, and maybe I, pay, I probably paid 50 cents a piece for them. They can be expensive. The Picket Programmer, uh, so I should change this. The Snap Programmer uses the Micro Clear port and also A0 and A1. The master clear port in A0 and A1. Yes, that is true. And then it also has power and ground. The push button on the Viva board can function as a reset or an input. That is correct. The trend in operating voltages for microprocessor is towards lower voltages. Yes, that is true. Bypass capacitors serve several purposes. One is to reduce switching noise. Yes, that's true. Hello World RGB LED has a common cathode. Yeah, uh, no, it's got a common anode. And you're driving the cathodes with the individual pins. That's why your pin has to be low to turn on each of the red, green, or blue colors. The PIC 16F1829 can be powered from about 1.8 volts to 5.5 volts. Yes, that is correct. The green terminal block is the output. Uh, the the green terminal block is the output of a transistor switch using the battery voltage. Yes, that is exactly what it is. And if you plug into that little two pin female uh, uh, header you can put in if you you put in hook it to any pin drive that pin high it will turn that on and it'll it, and it can source uh, it can it can source about 200 milliamps so uh, no about 150 milliamps 200 is probably too much uh, you may blow it with that all right now since we didn't we did go over the, the KL25Z but we didn't really use it, so, but hopefully you, you went through that video. I may not ask, 
I may change these to just the pick. But anyway, which processors have a stack pointer? All right, so the KL25Z does, and the PIC really doesn't. Uh, which ones have an address bus for program and data memory? So the PIC does, the KL25 has uh, the same address bus for both. The PIC has a different address bus for program memory and one for data memory. Which ones have at least 100K of flash? The KL25Z has 128K. The PIC has 8. Which ones have uh, only 14-bit instructions? The PIC has 14-bit instructions. The KL25Z has mostly 16-bit instructions and 6 32-bit instructions. Which ones have interrupt with a vector table? KL25Z. PIC has interrupts, but it does not have a vector table. All the interrupts get vectored to location 4 in the PIC. But there's a table, and it vectors a specific interrupt to a specific uh, vector table address in the KL25Z. Uh, which one has capability for multi-levels of sleep? So the PIC can definitely sleep, but the KL25Z can do multi-levels. Um, there are advantages for micros having on-chip peripheral modules like PWM, A to D, UART to provide common functions that would otherwise require an external component. No. Uh, well, yeah, that is right. We, we want to provide common functions and avoid external components if at all possible. To reduce circuit size, yes, that, that's another goal. If you can get it all done on mostly one chip, that's going to give you, make a lot smaller board than if you have multiple chips. The printed circuit boards can be simpler and smaller and, and easier to fabricate and populate. Yes, simpler boards are better. To save costs and allow for additional features at no added cost. Uh, yeah, that's right. Oftentimes, you may have a micro for a project. You're doing the project, and you realize in the process that, uh, son of a gun, I can add some functionality here that might be attractive to my customers. And it's not going to cost them anything because <clears throat> the micro already, already has that module built in. And all we have to do is... Uh, you know, uh, add that, those features with the printed circuit board. Maybe we have to, add, maybe we, you know, maybe we have to add a, uh, a connection somewhere uh, and hook up one of our A to D channels or, or who knows what, or a comparator, or, or who knows. We, we've got a lot of features on this board. Um, all right. Uh, to make chips capable of being used for a wide range of applications. That's right. These just any one of these processors can be used for a ton of different different applications because the on-chip modules will outperform a separate chip. No, generally the on-chip modules won't outperform a dedicated chip. Uh, usually the dedicated chips that you can buy now, at least, are, are going to be much more capable because who's going to buy them if they're no better than what's already on your microprocessor? So so the dedicated chips, separate you know, individual chips, are usually pretty high-performance chips. And that's why you might want to use one. Features of a micro that make it attractive for mobile battery operations include powered by a switching voltage regulator. Uh, yes, switching regulator uh, is definitely the way to go. Uh, these usually have a much, much higher efficiency, maybe 98%, 95%, uh, whereas your linear regulator is very inefficient. Uh, it, it's probably, well, when you run a 9-volt battery and power your board at 3.3 volts, just out of the box, that regulator could never be more than, um, let's see, so what is, what is, uh, here, let's do the math. So, so if we take a, we take our little calculator here. So let's say we're running at, uh, so we've got a 9 volt battery, uh, and we're running at 3.3 volts, so 3.3 uh, divided by 9. So, the best you could possibly do is to be 36%, 37% efficient. That would be maxed out. Because you already know that that uh, that 64% uh, 60, uh, of your power, or 63% of your power, is going to be wasted in the regulator. So the best you could do is 36%. So compare that to 95 or better percent. Clearly, a switching regulator is a much better choice for a battery-operated device. Uh, clocks can be generated from a wide variety of sources. Yes, that's right. Uh, it is nice to be able to have uh, internal clocks, external clocks, to save, uh, to, save the, the, uh, to save cost of the battery. You might very well want to use the internal clock module on your PIC, just like we do in all the labs. And that way, we didn't have to put uh, a crystal oscillator on the uh, 
you know, on the printed circuit board. Various levels of low leakage operation. Sleep, give her, uh, very, in other words, sleep, give a range of wake-up times. Yeah, so the KL25Z does have multiple levels. The pick just has one. It's either awake or asleep. But uh, putting it to sleep can definitely can definitely save uh, a lot of energy, and various levels of, of, of low leakage operation or sleep operation can give you even more robust choices in your application. Having many more GPIO pins than required. There's no point in having a lot of extra pins. It, it, it's probably wasteful, and, and uh, it may even suck up some power. Ability to operate over a range of supply voltages. Yeah, that's that's actually nice. You might not even need a regulator. You might just let your chip run at a, on, a, on the battery, start the battery pack at 5 volts, and let it run all the way down to 1.8 volts and uh, not even have a regulator. Uh, I probably wouldn't recommend that, but you could certainly do that. Ability to wake up from a number of different signals. Yeah, if you're going to do sleep, it's nice to have a number of different ways to wake it up. Having on-ship clock generation without extra parts. Yeah, uh, that's that's a generally a good thing. If you can do it all on-chip, it's usually more efficient, and it's certainly going to lower your costs. May, yeah. So most of these things would be true, uh, except for D. The rest of them would probably be pretty true. Pick all the factors uh, from below. Pushing embedded design towards higher level languages like C. Better compilers, yes. Uh, PWM modules on the chip, uh, not really. Uh, more intelligent devices, yeah, you want to make products that are more intelligent, and you're probably going to need to use a higher level language for that. Need for complex math, you bet. If you're doing complex math, uh, Katie, you know, Lord save you if you're uh, if you're going to try and do it in an assembly language. It's going to it's going to drive you crazy. Very complex firmware. Yeah, you want to use a higher level language. Push for short development times. Yes, generally, you can get it done faster in a higher level language than you can in assembly. Make fewer mistakes. Uh, have fewer lines of code you actually have to write. So you should get to market faster. Increased service mount packages. Has nothing to do with it. Uh, so that's not true. And projects with uh, complex user interface. Yes, complex user interface is going to take more lines of code. Uh, Higher level language is going to make that easier. Lower level language is going to make that task a little more challenging. Uh, so you want to use the higher level language. If a pin on the pick is set and configured as an output but left unconnected, it will read as. Okay, so this is really important. You need to have this firmly in your mind. Outputs, it's okay to leave them unconnected. Inputs, it's not okay. So if you have it set as, in, as an output, then, then it's going to read whatever you write to the pin. But when you have it set as an input and you leave it unconnected, then, and you read the input, well, then it's it's going to read, you know, it's 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 going to read whatever, whatever the floating electrostatic level is on that pin. It could push it into a one. It could it could be below one. Uh, you could even have negative that a negative uh, potential induced on it. So. So you, you can be all over the map, and you don't know if it's going to read a 1 or a 0. And as you move your hand around or, or you move the board in a, a close association with other objects, some of which may have charges on them, you're going to induce either, either higher levels or lower levels of uh, an EMF on that, on that pin, and it may or may not read uh, something that makes some kind of sense. It, anyway, it's, but it's... Yeah, I didn't really say that right. It's it's not going to make sense. It's going to be gobbledygook, you, and you don't know if it's going to be a one or a zero. All right. All right. So let's see. Uh, good practice for embedding design engineers include working to master the debug features of the IDE being used. Yes, I know most of you haven't really played with your debug features much uh, in the IDE, and for most of the stuff you do, uh, that's probably okay because usually you're making you know fairly gross errors that are pretty obvious on inspecting the source code. But when you really have a, some subtle errors and you're trying to figure out what's going on and there can be some weird things happening, you, that's when the debug features can be super helpful. And, and if, you're, if you do this all day for a living, you should make yourself very familiar with all the features of the debug. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Selecting chips that will have replacement parts available for many years to come. I think this is really important. 
a, a, a number of microprocessor companies uh, uh, take chips that they were producing for the last few years and then they retire them and they stop making them and you can't get them and, uh, and some of their newer parts aren't pin for pin compatible and the software is different and you're just going and you may have to go if you have a lot of pro products in the field a good example of this is the Department of Defense uh, they have missiles and operating systems like tanks and airplanes that have lots of microprocessors in them and if one of the microprocessors goes bad for some reason and they need to replace it and they can't get that part, uh, then they're back into doing an entire development and validation process. I mean, if you're going to put this in an airplane and you're going to have to do a, a new processor with a whole new set of software, oh my God, uh, it's like you're making a new airplane. The uh, You may have to do test flights. Lord, you may have to do a ton of stuff. And... Um, this this can be a, a, a really big problem. Uh, so uh, the fact that you can't get that replacement part can be a disaster. And the De Department of Defense has definitely run into this. And uh, they, have, they have had to do some very novel solutions because when they called up the manufacturers and tell them, look, we really have to have a replacement part because we have million dollars, you know, multi-million dollar systems. We may have, uh, you know, we may have 10,000, uh, you know, air-to-air -air missiles that ha that have this processor, and, and they've been going bad. And we need we need to order several hundred of them. And and the the micro the microprocessor company says, well, we don't make that anymore, but we'll 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 crank that up just for you. Um, but we're going to charge you a thousand dollars a piece for these parts, even though they only cost you know two dollars uh, originally. And, and this has happened. And uh, so so. When you're, you know, you need to think ahead, you know, is this chip going to be around? And uh, interestingly enough, I, I'm not a salesperson for microchip, but I will say one of the features is every single bore, every single chip they have ever made is still purchased. You can still buy it. Now, the prices cr creep up as the parts get older. Uh, what might have been sold for 50 cents a number of years ago may cost you three, three or four dollars now, but they're not going to charge you a thousand dollars for it. They're still available. Uh, they're still being produced and you can still get them. And uh, that's that actually I think is really speaks well for the company. Um, all right, and there may be other companies that do that too. I don't I don't know, but but they do. Selecting uh, selecting chips and families with a large range of options for cost and features. Yeah, uh, why would you want to go with a microprocessor company that only has one or two parts, and uh, and if you need to do another project. Uh, you probably won't be able to use one of their parts. You'll probably have to learn another integrated development system and another manufacturer's, uh, you know, all their idiosyncrasies, and 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 you're kind of starting from scratch. Why would you want to do that? Generally, you don't want to do that. Uh, there might be a there might be an occasion where that might be necessary, but in general, that would be a bad idea. Keeping comments in the in the code uh, brief and limited. No, you you want to make the comments really useful and. Uh, I guess you could have too many comments, but uh, generally more comments is better for maintaining code, especially if they're, you know, if they're accurate and useful comments. Um, if you're just, you know, commenting because just stating obvious things and things like that, then maybe that's not so helpful, but it doesn't, even then it doesn't hurt a whole lot. Standardizing name conventions for variables, functions, and constants. Yes, almost every company does have rules about this if they do a lot of software development, and they do want you to use their standardized rules for, for variables, functions, and constants. Avoid making code that has lots of function calls. No, uh, you should have uh, the, the, the functionality of your code divided up into functions. Uh, you shouldn't just create functions for the sake of creating functions. Uh, but you should try and create a function that that's you know that's more bite sizable, but it contains a logical chunk of of some function of your actual overall uh, system. And uh, you sh one of the things you do at the very beginning of your of your development time is you try and break your your overall system down into into functionally appropriate chunks, and and those should all then become separate functions. Clearly, uh, as much as you possibly can. 
And so your mainline routine becomes very readable and very comprehensible uh, because mostly you're just calling functions and uh, getting, getting, getting most of the detail work is done in the functions. And then the nice thing is you can develop these functions one at a time, debug them all by themselves, and then once you get the function working like you think it should, then you can integrate it. Uh, then, then you can integrate all the various functions into your total program, knowing that that the, that all you have to contend with is possible errors in how you integrate them, rather than worrying about uh, a particular function not doing what it's supposed to do. All right. Um, so uh, budgeting for additional time for software development. Yeah, you should always be suspicious that your software development is going to overrun the schedule. Little consideration for the user interface. Yeah, that's painfully obvious in a lot of products uh, that very little consideration was given. Uh, but, I, you know, it's just like when you're a surgeon and you do surgery and the patient wakes up. They don't have any idea how beautiful your pedicles are inside their belly and, and how little how little uh, result in scar tissue and bleeding and how, you know, how gentle you were at handling all the other tissues and, and, and how, you know, inside it looks like really great or looks like a bomb went off, but you got the job done. But what they see, they see the scar on their tummy. And if you leave a crappy scar, they, can, they tend to assume you did a crappy job on the inside too. And if you leave a, you know, a really beautiful scar, even if you're a bit of a ham hock surgeon and screwed up the inside, as so long as you didn't kill them, they're going to think you're a great surgeon. Uh, and that's true with products too. Products that have a really great user interface, uh, they may be a little clunky and slower than another project with a bad user interface, but believe me, you're going to get better reviews. Uh, very few people will tolerate a crappy user interface, even if other functionality is superior. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Your user interface is what your customer sees. And if they see a mess, they're going to think the rest of your system isn't so hot either. Even if you have maybe some of the whiz bang uh, functionality that you could possibly have been created, but your user interface is, is, is the face to the customer. And that's what you want to uh, look good. The watchdog timer uh, is useful for the following. Helping to make a program more fail safe. Yeah, that's right. Making development less costly. Um, you know, that's debatable. Probably, probably not. That may not be the best. May not be the best question in the world. I probably, you know, wouldn't ask it just like that again. But I might say making development time uh, much, much less costly than, I, than maybe something. Or make, or maybe uh, the watchdog timer. Uh, would add significant uh, cost increases to the development of the product. No, it wouldn't. It shouldn't add. It, it might add a little effort on the software side to make sure you you get the resets in the right places so uh, that the watchdog timer doesn't go off when it's not supposed to. Um, but I think in general the watchdog timer uh, it, it can be very helpful in in uh, in in proving the. Uh, you know, the fail-safe nature of your design. Preventing power surge from causing uh, in-the-field failure. Yeah, that's part of the idea. Maybe you get a little uh, power line surge or something, or there's a lightning strike nearby that causes, induces a little bit of EMF and get you, kind of zaps your circuit a little bit. If you had, if it could throw you into an infinite loop, and without a uh, watchdog timer, then you would have to have somebody come out and and turn the thing off and back on, or do something like that. Uh, but if you have a watchdog timer, then uh, usually it can get wake itself up and uh, get it going again automatically. Uh, keeping other manufacturers from reverse engineering your product. Uh, no, the, the, the watchdog timer doesn't really help you with that. That's the your, your code protect and code protect data. Okay, code development in the future will involve increasing use of helps like Processor expert or the Microsoft Code Configurer or others. Yeah, I think we'll see that more and more. The trend in embedded design is to move to higher level languages to get smaller code. Uh, not so much to get smaller code. Uh, I think mostly higher level languages produce larger code. But uh, uh, what it does do, it, it allows us to, all the other things we talked about earlier, get to market faster, add functionality, 
that would be difficult. Deal with calculated com uh, uh, computations in an efficient manner and a whole bunch of other things. All right. And I think that's... <coughs> Let's see. Uh, here's a little code for you. Given this code at the start of your primary tune, answer the following questions. So let's see. So Ansel is 0x10. So that's pin 7 in the A register. Tris A equals 0, so everything's an output. Uh, for J equals 1, J is less than oh, 10,000. Uh, J plus plus, assume radix is decimal. And then uh, RA4 uh, exclusive R equal to 1. So you're going to toggle it. You're going to toggle RA4. Wait, wait for one full second. Assume this code works exactly right. Okay, now uh, explain why this does not blink an LED correctly uh, hooked up to RA4. So the reason, and then here are the choices. The reason the above code doesn't work is that the Ansel bit must be cleared for a digital output. No, actually, outputs can can override uh, can override inputs. Uh, I mean, can override Ansel bits. But you you should have the Ansel bit cleared for, for digital input and for digital output. But it but digital input will not work if the bit's not cleared. Digital output will still work. It just uh, uh, maybe use a little more power can can cause power surges on the analog uh, part of the circuit that you wouldn't want, but <clears throat> you could you can probably live with this. The reason the above code does not work is the tris bit is not correct. All right, so is is the tris bit the RA4 bit? Well, yeah, it is because one zero hex is zero 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 one zero 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 zero. So it is bit four. That's exactly right, and uh, so so that's fine. Um, but notice the the that's the Ansel. The Tris bit, all of them were set for outputs. So the Ansel bit is not going to cause a problem with an output. So so that's really okay. So the correct answer then um, is the Tris bit is not correct. That is false. Because of read, modify, write logic for GPO pins, the Anzo bit can, uh, the Anzo bit with Anzo bit set. Yeah, so the Anzo bits, the Anzo bits set can cause wrong results. Um, no, uh, well, yeah, that is true that read, modify, write, and the Anzo bit being set wrong could cause problems. So that's true. The problem for, in the four, is signed integers in the PIC can't count to 10,000. Well, no. Signed integers in a PIC can go up to, to, uh, to half of the 16 bits. 16 bits will get you to, unsigned, they'll get you to 65K. So you can get to 32K uh, signed, but uh, or 32K minus 1, I guess. But if, you, but if your count number is bigger than 32K, you are going to have problems with, an, with a signed uh, integer for your... Uh, for your uh, uh, your index. All right. Um, so create a 32-bit mask. Make sure you can do this mask thing. And all you'd have to do is 23 uh, or one shifted 23 times, or with one shifted 19, or with one shifted seven. And then you either uh, you don't you you generally just um, and those together. That's all you really have to do. Okay, so I think that's uh, think that that's the that's all the general questions, um, and I'll probably I'll probably use some of these or similar ones. I'll uh, modify them a little bit, but uh, that'll be a good uh, that'll be if you can if you can answer all those that'll be a good test to see if you're studying. Go back and uh, review the videos. Uh, I'll do another review session where I'll, where I'll go over a lot of the material. Uh, uh, but uh, that should give you a little bit of a feel for the kind of questions that will be on the final. Um, it will be obviously a little different than that, but that, that's a start. All right, I think that's all I wanted to do. I'll end with that.